My name is Elaine Tully, and I'm honored to be president of Women Inspiring Women, the local branch of the Women's Institute. Having hosted all candidates' events in previous elections, we're pleased to share this event with the Paris and Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for taking an active interest in the life of our community and province by participating in this opportunity to hear from our candidates. Thank you to the candidates for stepping up to run in this election. Our democratic process is something we take for granted, but current events around the world remind us that we can be thankful for living in a free and democratic Canada. Women's Institute is a local, national, and international organization for people identifying as women that is now 125 years old. It began to connect and educate rural women in an effort to improve homemaking skills. It has become so much more. I'd like to share with you a couple of comments from members about what it means to be part of Women Inspiring Women. WI is an organization for all people who identify as women of all professions and ages. Its membership reflects diversity and inclusivity. It is an unbroken bond between women in a sisterhood that empowers, inspires, and supports other women. The WI's pulse is its mandate for advocacy, building community, and supporting families. Our branch attracts caring, generous, and community-minded women, not only from Paris, but the surrounding areas such as Brantford, Ayr, and Burford. We are city-turned-small-town people. We are Paris born and raised. We are rural folk. We are career women. We are farmers. We are retired. We have young families. We are different but we are the same. We are women interested in supporting and being supported by other women and giving back to the community that offers us so much. We are having fun and doing good at the same time. Women Inspiring Women welcomes you to our regular meetings the second Thursday of each month, usually at the Paris Fairgrounds. We welcome you to try us out for a couple of meetings before making your decision to join. Take a look at our Facebook page for details each month. Around the room tonight, you'll see women wearing blue name badges, and if you have any questions, by all means, approach them and get to know us. We want to thank the Paris Presbyterian Church for allowing us to hold this evening's forum in their For Paris Center. The church has undergone renovations to make the space more functional for community events. We appreciate their generosity in allowing us to utilize this beautiful space. The church pastor, Joel Sherbino, would like to say a few words of welcome. Thank you and good evening as well. I just wanted to say uh, great for you to be here and uh, as a church, we want to be a church that's not simply in the community, but is really for the community. And so opening up our space for opportunities like this is clearly where we want to be. And so we're, we're glad to see our space uh, being used. Um, and we look forward to continuing to uh, be a part of this community uh, moving forward. And so if there's other opportunities, we'd love to uh, partner with you as well. And so thanks again for being here uh, tonight. And uh, thank you for all uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, do this as well. Thank you. Pam DeVries, Chamber Advocacy Chair, and Marilyn Sewell from Women Inspiring Women will be acting as co-moderators tonight. I'm going to hand things over to Marilyn and Pam to introduce the candidates and explain the format for the evening. Hmm? Go ahead. Okay, I'm assuming this is on. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank the candidates for being in attendance tonight and uh, taking part in, this, in the democratic process and, and being uh, ready to tell you what your party is standing for in, in, this, uh, in this upcoming election. Yep. Okay, 
The first person that we have here is Ruby Tour. Ruby is from the Liberal Party. Let's give her a welcome. We have uh, Harvey Bristol from the NDP. Is that right? Bishkoff. Bishkoff, I'm sorry. And Carly Zordis from the Green Party. Thank you, Carly. My name is Pamela DeVries, and I'm delighted to be a member of both of the, uh, the Chamber and the WI. And I'd like to thank all the candidates for coming this evening and taking the time to be here. We want to do a few housekeeping items this evening. Um, first of all, we will tell you where the washrooms are. So they are through the doors here to the, uh, my left. Um, just so that we don't have anybody looking for those along the way. We'd like you to be respectful of the candidates and we're asking that we'll have no negative comments or heckling and should there be any, you will be asked to leave. Um, you can see that we do have an empty chair. Mr. Buma of the PC party was given the same opportunity and the questions that the candidates have all been given and he declined to answer the questions which we offered to read on his behalf or to attend. We had hoped perhaps he would come, but he still has not shown up. The format of the evening will be as follows. Each candidate will be given a three minute introduction so that they can give you a little bit of an idea of who they are. And then they will be answering the questions. They will be given two and a half minutes to do so. We have some lovely ladies from the WI up front here who will be notifying them with a cue card when they have 30 seconds left. And we have another card to remind them they are now done with, along with a little bell that they, you will hear. We'd like to ask you to please turn off your cell phones so that they don't interfere as the candidates are speaking. And uh, once we have completed our, our questions and our closing remarks this evening, you're more than welcome to mingle with the candidates and speak with them personally. So um, we're also just asking that if you do that, if you choose to stay, if we could try and be done by about 8.45 and then we'll close up the doors by 9. So without further ado, we will start with our questioning. And the questions have been, uh, the names were put in a random order, and, and they will change throughout the sequence so that nobody's answering in the same order all the time. So it's, uh, it's my delight to start, start, well, first of all, we'll start with the introductions, and we will start with Ruby. I hope it is okay if I'm sitting and answering the questions. Let me know if you guys are comfortable with it. Thank you. I would like to thank Chamber of Commerce and WI for hosting this meeting, and all of you for attending it, and also the church for giving us a beautiful venue to be here. Uh, thank you for that. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruby Tour, and I'm delighted to be your provincial liberal candidate for the upcoming election. I came to Brantford with my family, my husband and two children, 30 years back in 1992. I raised my children here in Brantford while helping my husband running his business, which I did for 10 years. I have a degree in Bachelor of Science and degree in Homeopathic Medicine, and then I went to University of McMaster, and I did another degree in Gerontology before I switched my career to going to retirement sector. I have been working as an executive director for the last 20 years. So while I was working as an executive director, I got the chance to sit on many committees on boards. Just to name a few, Grand River Council on Aging, Heart and Stroke Foundation, Alzheimer's Society, on a board of public health, Branch United Way, Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, and recently as the president of CARP, Canadian Association of Retired Persons. During this time, I got to learn and meet people and actually see from the ground level, because in 20 years of the career while you are meeting people, you get to see and learn a lot of things. So the reason, the reason I have put my name in the hat to be your provincial 
uh, MPP, Member of Parliament, is because I believe, I believe and I know I can make a difference. I believe there is a lot of change required over here. A lot of things have gone on the back burner. There are gaps in the system, which I know. I know firsthand I, I can fulfill them. Okay, I'm a good listener, also a talker. I'm a good listener, compassionate listener, and I believe in helping people. I will bring together, uh, I will bring brighter future while strengthening our healthcare system businesses and increasing access to affordable and complete housing, safe and secure environment in schools, better, fast and reliable transit system, equal pay for equal work for women, and expand on women's health, focusing on child care and find ways to combat climate change. We all want our children to succeed in, school, in the schools and schools are the vital part of their life. We would like our children to learn and have a positive and safe experience in schools. I would work with municipal... Okay, I can see the time up. So all I will say by wrapping up is saying, I will be a good candidate for you to vote for, and I will look forward for your support. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks to the Chamber and WI for the invitation. I appreciate it, and appreciate that uh, the folks who are able to show up here live or who are watching on, uh, watching on uh, streaming uh, for, for participating in this. I um, want to acknowledge my, uh, the other two candidates as well. Um, you know, appreciate them being here. This is how the democratic process works. And although um, it's by no means the whole job, it's part of the job that you show up. Uh, you show up and you share your ideas and your vision and you listen to constituents and it's how you show them respect and how you move, move the process forward. So I'm Harvey Bischoff. I'm running for the NDP uh, to be an MPP because what I really want to do is work with you to fix the things that matter most to you and your family. We know that a lot of things are broken right now. The cost of living is sky high and pressing people in ways um, that uh, we haven't seen in a long time. We know that health care and seniors care are largely broken and absolutely need to be fixed. And I want to participate with you in, in um, making those fixes. You know, as I go around to doors and between my team and I, we've hit about 10,000 doors so far before the official campaign period even starts because we're serious about talking to folks. Um, I'm hearing from people that they can't wait for change. They need change now. And we know that um, one of the ways we're going to get that is simply the Doug Ford government has to go. Um, and the replacement can't be a Liberal Party under Stephen Del Duca who broke many of the things that uh, Doug Ford has either further broken or simply failed to fix. You know, big cuts and bad choices are what have gotten us here and we can't go further breaking the publicly funded education system, breaking the health system that we rely on. You know, more personally, I, I live in this community, I care about this community, I've raised children who have gone to elementary and secondary school and have now uh, launched into their young adult lives. Um, as of next year, we'll have, we'll have four kids in post-secondary, um, one still in grade 12 right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have connection here that's, that's important to me. And, in my last job, I was, uh, I was president of an education union. I represented educators, and I represented the publicly funded education system. And in that work, I was an advocate, and I had to be a fierce advocate when we were dealing with a government that uh, was trying to dismantle a world-class education system. The kind, of, um, the kind of passion, the kind of commitment, and the kind of um, thoughtful strategy that I brought to that fight is exactly what I want to bring to being your MPP here in Brantford Brant. Um, bringing your voice, your concerns, your issues, and your aspirations to Queen's Park and fighting on your behalf. And Carly. Thanks, Pam. Uh, thank you to the Parish Chamber and the Women's Institute for hosting this event. My name's Carly Sordis, and I'm the Green Party candidate for Brantford Brant. I'm a University of Waterloo graduate with an honors in kinesiology and a postgraduate post diploma in clinical kinesiology. 
I've been involved with many local green initiatives to make our community more sustainable, and I, I currently work as a recreation therapist at a long-term care home in Simcoe. My drive for both my career and my volunteer work is how I deeply care about our community and about the people who live in our community. You may remember me from last fall when I ran federally for the first time for the Green Party of Canada. My motivation is the same, to be a breath of fresh air in politics and to encourage more people of my generation to get involved and truly just to be a part of the democratic process. I want us to stay hopeful for the future and our shared purpose to leave a livable planet and a just society for our children and grandchildren and this all remains strong to today. We have seen how fast we can mobilize during the pandemic and we really need this for healthcare, we need this for affordable housing, the climate crisis, clean water, and I could go on for days. <laughs> I'm really enjoying hearing from the people in our community about the changes that they want to see. I'm ready to use my voice to speak the truth, to communicate about what's happening in our community and our province, and to make those changes a reality. People across Ontario are realizing that old party lines of half measures aren't going to cut it anymore. The Greens are offering new solutions to old problems, and I really thank you for joining us here today to hear the different options and to think of the kind of Ontario that you want to see. I would love if every single person in Brantford Brant could get out for June 2nd and just vote. <laughs> so thank you everybody for being here today. And now on to the questions. Question one, uh, the order that they will be answered will be Harvey going first. The question was, with Bill 124 salary increases were capped at 1% for frontline healthcare workers. Many healthcare workers have left the professions in large numbers due to burnout, being overworked and underpaid or government mandates. All this during a skilled labor shortage, aging population and a pandemic. How does your party plan to address this staffing shortage? Thank you, and such a critical question right now. We knew before uh, the pandemic hit us that the healthcare system was already staggering. And now, uh, in the midst still of a pandemic, uh, hopefully towards the tail end, but it's hard to judge, we've seen that the healthcare system has essentially been driven to its knees. Um, and it's only being held together by the hard work of, of healthcare workers who are going above and beyond. Um, you know, Bill 124 was Doug Ford's low wage policy. It was a way of keeping down wages for people who are contributing enormous amounts to keeping us safe right now. And what it means for people like nurses is that every year they fall behind the rate of inflation. Every year in real terms they make less money while working harder and harder. And I was on the doorstep with a nurse with three children this afternoon who, who was talking about being on a ward with 30 patients and three nurses. Um, and, it's, and it's unsustainable. That, that can't continue. And Bill 20, 124 was really modeled on Bill 115, which the Del Duca uh, win liberals brought in earlier. First thing, Bill 124 has to be repealed. People have to have the right to freely negotiate collective agreements that allow them, you know, at the very least to keep up with the rate of inflation so they're not in real terms making less each year. Uh, so we will um, repeal that. We will invest, not cut. We will look to hire the 30,000 nurses that we're told by experts are required additionally in Ontario's, uh, in Ontario's health system. Um, 15,000 of those uh, could be brought in fairly quickly simply by accelerating the credentialing for foreign trained um, nurses so we could get halfway to solving the problem right there. And then there are other things you can do to recruit and retain the additional 15,000 and um, you know, one of them is, is reasonable wages. Uh, it's also appropriate training. So, um, and I've, you know, I've heard this from within the healthcare system uh, that, that the transition from, from education as a nurse to uh, being you know, in a hospital ward is, is staggering and they need support. Uh, we look at um, hiring, uh, rehiring um, retired nurses who would want to come back um, on, a, you know, on an occasional basis to provide mentorship. Um, with those things, you can support uh, 
bring in the nurses we need and then retain them because we can't have them coming in one end of the pipeline and just flowing out the other because, um, because the wages are unreasonable, because the workload is unreasonable. Harley. Throughout this whole pandemic, time and time again, the Premier has stood in front of us with a microphone in his hand and called our nurses and our healthcare staff heroes. I see it as well in my long-term care home. We have heroes written everywhere to inspire the nurses to keep going forward. But with the Premier, his actions with Bill 124, they paint a way different picture. The Ontario Nurses Association, as well as the nurses at my long-term care home, have made it clear that repealing Bill 124 will help the staffing shortage crisis and allow the nurses the tools that they need to work for better for all of us. The pandemic has been really hard on Ontario frontline workers, and we all know that the nurses are the backbone of Ontario's healthcare system. But after two years of our global pandemic, they're facing illness and burnout. Since Bill 124 was introduced in 2019, nursing wages have been frozen and their right for collective bargaining has been suppressed. Nurses deserve fairness, equity, and a lot of respect. The pandemic has put our healthcare system under strain and it's breaking down. Hospitals are facing up to 20% vacancy rate for nursing positions and they're overworked, underpaid, and it's actually collapsing as well. Instead of helping them, Bill 124 takes away their ability to negotiate fair wages and supports like mental health counseling. Ontario healthcare heroes have had their wages capped at 1% when inflation right now is at 5%. If we want to talk about gender inequality, predominantly women frontline workers are actually taking the pay cut. We need to repeal Bill 124 so women frontline workers and all frontline workers can negotiate fair wages. They're truly fighting for change. A key component is streamlining the lengthy and cumbersome College of Nursing of Ontario process of granting licenses to qualified internationally educated nurses. We need to repeal Bill 124 to give all nurses the raise they deserve. We need to implement a program to pay all nurses an additional 5% an hour if they're working on short staff unit or their department. You wouldn't believe the work that they do when they have at least one nurse off duty. We need to provide guaranteed access to mental health services for all nurses. We will practice by the Registered Nurses Association recommendations to have 50% more nurses by 2030. Long-term care, retirement homes, seniors, they are very close to my heart. I have been working with them for the last 20 years. Staffing shortages did not come overnight. There were cuts made. Cuts were made before even the pandemic hit in March, 20, March 2020. Because of Bill 124, the uh, salaries and there were cuts for one per uh, they were capped at one percent. And also because of the section of the bill 106, the pay equity was also, um, there was a gap in that too. So the workers, the, we, it's true, we call them heroes. The, the, Frontline workers, personal support workers, nurses, RNs, and anyone who's working at frontline, I did myself. For an entire period of pandemic, I was there day and night, helping my staff, helping my residents, make sure they understood they were safe. So that was a big job. And we understand how difficult it is when you go home and you don't get paid enough. So first of all, liberals will do, they will they will give them the minimum wage will start from $16 and then built on the living wage, which is important to bring economic dignity back. Ontario Liberals will also increase healthcare wages to fair wages for PSWs to $25 and for nurses and RPNs accordingly. We will repeal the wage capping bill 124 and the section of the bill 106 as I just mentioned. Establish and enforce protest exclusion zones around healthcare buildings and hospitals. Introduce portable benefits. That's very important. Person who's working in such conditions and working day and night, this is why they get burnt out when they do not have enough benefits. So introduce portable benefit plan for everyone, including casual and contract workers, dental vision, and mental health. Also, the 10 sick days will be um, allotted to them as well, so they have a choice 
to stay home when they're sick. Thank you. The second question, and Ruby, you'll be starting this time, is affordable housing is a huge problem in Brant County. With the current migration to smaller, more affordable communities and little inventory, the cost of affordable housing has skyrocketed. In the past three years, the price of homes in Brant County has almost tripled in some cases, making it unattainable for first-time home buyers or seniors trying to remain in their community. Much of the newly built mandated growth homes are, are, large, are, not, are large, not priced in the category for an average buyer. Renting is much the same. A one-bedroom one apartment can cost as much as $2,000 a month. The federal government has stated there were 10,000 affordable homes built across the country. However, since that number of homes could be utilized in Toronto alone, where do smaller communities stand when it comes to affordable housing? How will your party plan on dealing with the affordable housing in Ontario? Thank you for asking this question. Ontario is undoubtedly in the midst of housing crisis, seeing rent and skyrocket pricing of the housing are driving young talents out of the province while making it impossible for families to make ends meet. Addressing this challenge requires leadership, a bold vision, and a multi-pronged approach. Ontario Liberals will be building complete communities with supporting municipalities to quickly approve new housing and build complete, integrated, resilient, and safe neighborhood with access to fast, reliable, and affordable public transit system, recreational amenities, parks, trails, community centers, and urban green space, as well as hospitals, schools, childcare centers. Creating smart density. We will create different, there will be um, mid-risers, there will be duplex, triplex, fourplex, so there will be mixed range, not only skyscrapers or the big houses. Developing affordable housing, we need our transformational change in this sector with robust plan that will secure steady supply of affordable housing. We have a lot of people coming now, the population is increasing, but there is not enough supply. So this is the main reason we are facing this crisis. We will also script MZOs, Minister's Zoning Orders, which is only, happen, only helping to the big builders and rich people. Used to pave over wetlands and environmentally sensitive areas to bypass and also uh, to stop bypassing community consultation and local municipalities. Our government will make community consultation flexible and accessible through uh, modern digital tools and social media to reach wide range of people. Stopping local and foreign speculators on Ontario's housing market will also stop the skyrocketing of the housing prices. Thank you. And Harvey, you're next. Thank you. Um, I think there's no issue that I hear about more um, from folks is the, is the uh, issue with uh, lack of affordability of housing. Um, it's, it's touching uh, young people who are, I, I spoke to a 33-year-old uh, guy last week who um, has managed to get into an apartment condo but is not able to uh, imagine that he'll be able to give his kid a backyard to play in the way his parents did for him. And that's, uh, that's kind of crushing to think about uh, people not, not aspiring to do better, you know, generation after generation as we have for so long. So I hear about it. It is, uh, it is a very serious issue. Um, and um, what we've seen from Doug Ford is really no interest in grasping the issue on behalf of the people of Ontario, other than a limited few buddies of his, who are in a position to, um, you know, if he has his way, pave over farmland, build big houses that virtually nobody can afford, that simply doesn't provide the kind of housing that we need um, in a community like this, in a riding like this. Um, and so, so he, he doesn't have the answers, and he's not interested in them, and in the previous 15 years we didn't see meaningful action taken um, to address the affordable housing crisis that was already looming. Um, so it has to be a multifaceted strategy in order to address the affordability of housing, and it has to be a strategy that works both for renters and for, for prospective homeowners. Um, 
you know, it should be viewed as a human right. That's the way I would view housing, is something that you, is that you fight tooth and nail for, uh, that you go to the wall for, because people need to have a safe, a decent uh, place uh, where they can live, where they can, where they can raise their families. So, first of all, bring back real rent control um, and, have, and have a set limit to which uh, rents can rise and not have what you have now where landlords can engage in what are sometimes termed rent evictions where people are, are removed and rent is jacked up between tenants. We need to substantially increase the, uh, the housing stock. We need to build something like 100,000 affordable houses and, and tens of thousands of supportive housing to help people get off the streets provide direct supports to hundreds of thousands of renters so that they're able to not be crushed by the cost of their, of their monthly rent. Um, there are more things, but like I say, a multi-faceted strategy is required to address this. To put this into perspective, in 2019, 0% of rental housing from cities from Barrie to Kitchener, all the way from Ottawa to Hamilton, was not affordable for a minimum wage worker. If you're looking to buy a home in, on, in Toronto, it takes the average person 32 years to save for a down payment. Tent cities are popping up in cities large and small now. We have, affordable, we have an affordability crisis that needs to be addressed right now. Instead of more highways and parking lots as the Premier wants to do, let's set aside more time for urban space for healthy and community-focused living. Getting into home ownership is next to impossible for my generation, including here in Brantford Brant. We're facing an increasing in cost and impacts of the climate crisis. Student loans, global economic uncertainty, it all adds up and it's easy to see how we're also facing a mental health crisis. The Greens see how affordable housing issues and mental health go hand in hand. The Green government will chart a path forward to solve the housing crisis in Ontario without paving over our precious farmland and green space. We need mixed diverse neighborhoods with townhomes, laneway suite co-ops, and yes, even tiny homes, all of which will make home ownership more accessible, livable, and affordable. We need a guaranteed livable income, and we also must dismantle systemic racism. We must start thinking about jobs and teaching mental health, childcare, and the arts as low carbon jobs, because they are. We must invest, invest in protecting nature, creating jobs in the, in the global green economy, outdoor recreation, and sustainable local food productions. This is how we're gonna fix the housing affordability crisis and tackle mental health hand in hand. All three levels of government have to come together with social service agencies, advocacy organizations, and the private sector to put forth permanent supportive housing solutions to address the homelessness crisis that we're facing in our community. I want to see these solutions funded right here in Brantford Brant and other communities across the province. Affordable housing is a basic human right and home ownership shouldn't be out of the reach for our generation, especially after spending five years in university. <laughs> Question three, there is a distinct problem with the lack of both skilled labor and general laborers in the Brantford Brant area. Employers are rising incomes and offering benefits to try and entice workers to their businesses. Time and time again, you hear of a company hiring and often training a worker only to have them work a day or two and not return. In Brant County, there is an issue of transportation. Many general labor jobs are not within a walkable area and there is no transit system. How will your party work to increase employment in the county? And Carly will start. These are great questions in which also go hand in hand. How can businesses attract and retain good talent? And how can the people of Brantford Brant have access to good, well-paying and local jobs? Of course, having an effective public transportation system is a key part of achieving both goals. Brant County introduced what is now Brant Transit, and it's a first step towards local public transportation in 2020. It's not perfect, but it is definitely a great step. Community planning for building connected, livable communities are vital to the economy. Livable communities attract good workers and families. 
We need to make it safer and easier for people to access key goods and services other than by car. And we can do, there's so much more we can do. I can definitely say myself, the reason I had to get a car is because I couldn't walk or bus or take public transportation to get to my workplace. So I do prefer to choose a greener option. Some example, examples that we can do, we can establish and protect bike lanes, and that include adaptive bikes, so that cycling can be available for seniors and people with disabilities. We need to make bike lanes, patios, and green space a priority over street parking. And we need to change our planning and zoning priorities to increase the number of people living within 15 minute walks or bikes of stores and services that they want. Local businesses are an essential part of building a vibrant, livable community. The stores, the, the shops, the services are really what brings the main streets to life. It creates good local jobs and ultimately generates prosperity and a vibrant economy for the local community. The Green Party will open up more opportunities for small businesses to thrive. We will make it easier for small businesses to pay a living wage by lowering the payroll tax that they pay, regardless of whether they're making a profit or not. By working with municipalities like Brant and the local businesses to build connected, livable communities, we can create good jobs right here in Brantford Brant that pay living wages. We won't have to go to Toronto, we can have it here and growing communities where people not only can, but truly do live, work, and play in one area. Okay, I will start with job stability first. It's very important to have a culture of respect at the job where you work. It's apart from getting good wages, which liberals will be giving, they are starting their wages from $16, and then they will be building them on the living wage. There are other things which are required, as I mentioned earlier, the benefit, sick days. So liberal will provide portable drug, dental, and mental health services, built up to a four-day work week so you may spend more time with families. Ensure business offer equal pay for equal work. Provide 10 paid sick days, as I mentioned earlier, and match up $1,000 in annual retirement savings for low-income earners, including portable savings plan for gig and contract workers. Now, about the transportation. Public transportation is critical for many to reach to work. We have slow or sense, uh, serve no service on Saturdays or Sundays. Many workers rely on public transportation to reach to their work between county and um, Brantford. So they cannot come to the work. I've, I've faced that with my staff. Uh, there's no show on Saturdays, there's no show on Sundays, and the reason is because they don't have cars, so they need public transportation. Or nurses, they cannot f finish their sh shift till 11 o'clock because they there's no bus service after that. So that's one thing when I will become your MPP and I will work with municipalities and make sure this gap is filled. Because there are a lot of students here, there are a lot of immigrants here who cannot afford cars right now. So they need to, fill this gap to, so they can go from one place to another place. Even for groceries, they need to use the public transport. Ontario Liberals World, lower transfer, uh, transit fares to $1 a ride for anywhere you go, and this is for next two years. I think it's a very good incentive, especially for the newcomers. And we'll spend $375 million in operating cost to municipalities. So this is how Liberals will help uh, the transit system. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, clearly, businesses in the riding can't prosper without a ready and, in some cases, in many cases, a skilled workforce as well. As well. Um, part of the reason we're, we're seeing ourselves in the situation that we have right now is because um, Doug Ford has shown repeatedly that he puts the big guys ahead of small and local businesses. Um, right through the pandemic, we saw him give big box stores the advantage um, over over the you know the smaller local guys, uh, and uh, and they've paid the price for that. He shoveled billions of dollars out the door into businesses that didn't qualify, didn't need it, didn't require the support, um, and and. 
just last week at my uh, official campaign office opening, I talked to uh, a local uh, small business owner, an entrepreneur, who twice was eligible for supports for the government and the third time was told he wasn't eligible without rhyme or reason. And this is a guy who has followed all the rules and can't understand why as a small businessman, the Ford government has, has cut him out. And you know, you go back before that, we remember 300,000 manufacturing jobs leaving the province during, uh, during the liberal era, um, and we can't repeat that sort of thing. So first of all, it's, part, it's about relationships. It's about who you choose to stand with, and we choose to stand with small and local business. Um, that's where, where our hearts will be. Um, we do have a plan to attract more skilled workers into the trades. Um, we need to start in school. We need to show the trades as a, as a viable um, and, and in many cases lucrative uh, pursuit uh, as, a, um, uh, as a way to earn a living. Um, you know, these are good jobs for smart people in the skilled trades and we need to promote them as, as such. We'll work with the industry to develop long-term projections of labor so that we can prepare for demand because we actually knew for some time that this shortage was likely coming, but it wasn't, it wasn't addressed, um, it wasn't planned for. Uh, so government can impose solutions, but they don't do any good if they, if they are not done in collaboration with, with industry. Um, with regard to transit, and I have, I have very little time, I see, there are a number of things we can do. We can restore funding that was cut to raise operating cost uh, funding back up to, uh, to 50%. We can stop using P3s, which always sound wonderful um, in theory and turn out uh, costing the public more or shout changing them in the quality of the project that's ultimately delivered. Um, and we can sure, make sure that transit planning is based on evidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brant County is rich in agricultural production. We need farmers to provide food for Ontario's growing population. But many farm children do not want to continue on that path. The increased mandates for growth in municipal areas have also repurposed a sizable portion of our agricultural land for housing. We are losing not only the land for agriculture, but often natural habitat areas within those lands. How does your party plan to ensure the agricultural industry in Brant County is protected and maintained? And Ruby will start this off. Thank you, so very good question. We learned a lot through pandemic, but one thing we definitely learned that how important is agriculture for us. It was homegrown, Ontario grown food, which was helping us out during that time. First of all, I'll start with youth. Youth needs to be they need to be created with awareness among the youth about the career potentials that exist in agriculture and expanding ac academic and training opportunities. A lot of youth and their teachers and uh, parents don't even know about the job availability in this field. So our education and training plan will outline how we will take a holistic approach towards skills and professional development, allowing our youth to become familiar with uh, with and get trained on a broad range of career oppor opportunities. Housing. We will also, as I said, will be building complete and dense or medium smart community, stopping ur urban sprawl. We are committed to supporting municipalities to quick approve new housing. There will be also uh, no corporation tax for businesses hard hit by pandemic and no incorporation tax for the new startups. So that will help young youths to come into agriculture. Um, consultations and local, uh, we will also scrape zoning order that I mentioned earlier as well, and we will take consultation and, from the local municipalities as well. We will protect and expand green belt and designating 30% of Ontario land as protected area up from 10%. I think it's a very good step forward. Increase transit system to connect the dots between the uh, Brantford and Brant County, and as I mentioned, there will be a dollar a right at least for the next two years. Thank you. Carly? Okay, here's the problem. Ontario is losing 175 acres of farmland every day. That's the equivalent of five family farms a week. Highway 413 alone would destroy 2,000 acres of prime farmland. Unchecked sprawl development threatens Ontario's food and farmers and undermines 
rural livelihoods. Green supports robust public participation in land using planning, and we will bring back oversight and public consultation to protect the people and the places we love. We will restore the ability of the conservation authorities, like the GRCA, to protect our wetlands, drinking water, and natural features. The Greens are committed to robust public consultation on development and only using ministers' zoning orders in the most exceptional circumstances. The scale on land use and development policies have been tipped in favor of the developers and proponents of urban sprawl. People shouldn't have to fight to protect valuable agricultural and natural lands from development. They should be protecting and preserving by default and only developing for the purpose when the need for development is demonstrated. To do this, the Greens are proposing to freeze urban growth boundaries, permanently protecting farmland, and plan for smart growth instead. This means identifying locations where new housing developments are possible within existing built-up areas, and reinstating that the support for municipalities to re remedy brownfields for neighborhood development so that we can make the most of our already developed and serviced land. In addition to protecting the agricultural land, we also have to protect the farming as a viable income to attract future generations. The Greens will increase on farming income by compensating for the natural services that farms provide, similar to the ALUS program in Norfolk, and pay farmers and other landholders for verified ecosystem services. We will eliminate property tax penalties and encourage values added on farm business. Shifting program dollars from supporting corporate indus industrial agriculture to supporting soil health agriculture and protecting farmers against losses for up to 10 years while making the transition and much more. So, you know, I'm not a farmer, I certainly have things to learn here, but I am one of the 14 and a half million Ontarians, in other words, all of us who relies on farmers. Um, and I'm, I think I'm bright enough to understand the slogan, no farms, no food, no future. Um, it's pretty clear the, that we need this work done. It's clear from an economic point of view that when you're talking about a little over $47 billion of Ontario's GDP coming from the farming sector, that it's crucial um, that we protect it. Um, and across the province, something like 860,000 people engaged um, in farming for a living. So we need to help farmers thrive. We need to uh, provide infrastructure um, for things like, um, like accessible high-speed broadband, um, and we need to have excellent services nearby, uh, like health care in schools. And it was interesting, just last week I was looking at the uh, OFA's priorities, and, and at the top of the list was a mental health strategy um, that, would, that would address concerns for farmers. When you look at the NDP plan to bring uh, mental health supports into OHIP so that you can start to access mental health with your OHIP card rather than your credit card, think of how, uh, how helpful that would be to people who are looking uh, for that kind of support. We've seen business get tougher for farmers. The in cost of inputs has gone up. There's been fluctuating uh, market prices and of course the cost of fuel is through the roof. So things need to change. Um, We've seen, we've seen what Doug Ford wants to do, which is allow developers to pave over farmland and they get lost forever under those circumstances and we can't allow that to happen. And Stephen Del Duca, when he was a cabinet minister at Kathleen Wynne's cabinet table, capped the business risk management program and so you can't really trust them to fix the things that they went ahead and, and broke. So what I want to work for as your MPP are more investments in rural transportation, health care, as you know, as I addressed partly with the mental health care, schools and infrastructure, work alongside farmers to develop a provincial food and water strategy to strengthen the resilience of our supply chain from the farm to, uh, to the table, and um, put in place a strategy to protect prime farmland and water. Finally, um, you know, we, would, uh, we would lift the cap on the business risk management program, giving farmers a fair chance.
This next question, Harvey, you'll be starting off the answer. And naturally, some of our questions overlap a little bit because our life overlaps in various parts of what we're thinking and concerned about. Long-term care has been neglected for many years. During the pandemic, it became glaringly obvious as many residents and staff became ill or died. Ontario led the way in deaths and illness in long-term care. This highlighted the problems we have in both for-profit and not-for-profit homes. The number one problem is staffing, but couple that with the lack of daily recreation, inferior quality meals, and inappropriate personal care, and we are seeing this decline on a daily basis. A recent survey was shared with each of you from the Family Coalition Action, I'm sorry, the Family Council Action Coalition, showing the actual on-site perceptions from 472 respondents from 94 different homes across Ontario. Long-term care was left out of the 2022 federal budget. With an increasing aging population, how does your party plan to deal with the long-term care crisis in Ontario? Harvey, you'll start. Thanks, and I will say this, uh, this is seriously a big part of why I'm running, because, because what's happened so far is unconscionable and it needs to be fixed. The pandemic revealed the disaster that we have in long-term care in Ontario, um, close to, certainly over 4,000, close to 5,000 um, seniors, family members, died uh, alone in many, many cases because of the pandemic, alone and in pain, and insufficiently cared for. And we, we just, we can't go back to that. Um, we can do much better. We can have long-term care that provides people um, comfort and dignity in aging. Um, and we need to start working on that now. We've seen over the last two governments the um, increase in f large institutional for-profit uh, corporations. And I don't think um, warehousing seniors in, in institution-like facilities is the way to go. We cut corners on staffing because money was going into profits um, and our seniors became, became more vulnerable. Doug Ford tried to do the bare minimum at the start of his term um, and, in, and in the end, thousands were left to die. And now it's unbelievable to me that Doug Ford is rewarding the bad actors who cause so much suffering in, in private uh, for-profit long-term care homes, handing the very worst homes 30-year uh, license extensions and more beds so that they can make more money from our seniors. Um, and, and you know, maybe even more unbelievable than that is the fact that he passed a law to protect long-term care homes from being sued by, um, by those who lost, lost loved ones. Um, so like I say, it's a big reason that I'm running. We have a big comprehensive plan that I'm proud of. Step one, make the long-term care uh, sector public, not for profit. And we've seen the data that shows that seniors were safer um, in those facilities. Have smaller, more home-like facilities for seniors. Provide supports so that they can age at home to the extent that that's possible and wherever that is the best solution, um, because in many cases that is the best place um, for somebody to, to age. Um, We need, to, we need to increase staffing, we need to staff up, and one of the ways you do that is increase pay for those folks who are working in these facilities, and there's more. <laughs> this is one topic. This is one topic when I talk about it, it pours my heart. Seniors, they are, are people who died during pandemic, should have never happened. They are none other but our parents, grandparents, our seniors, our family members, our neighbors. So what happened through the pandemic due to the short cuts given to the staffing and other reasons should have never happened. Ontario Liberal government will bring sweeping changes and revolutionary change to the province approach to seniors health care, helping ensure that our parents and grandparents are comfortable, healthy and safe, and most importantly, are able to live at home as far as they like. We will end for-profit long-term care and provide 400,000 more seniors with home care. The the 
introduced um, the introduction of the home care guarantee that will ensure an additional 400,000 seniors, as I just mentioned, in next four years. Boost funding for home care by over 2 billion through annual 10% increase. Build 15,000 more assisted living homes and advance a community care model. Expand and make permanent the seniors' home safety tax credit and allow seniors to renovate their homes to make them safer and make the Ontario caregiver tax credit refundable tax and paid out throughout the year and enhance access to support programs and tools for those who take care of loved ones. So this will help seniors to stay home longer and as far as they like. Now for sector, for seniors that need long-term care because eventually one day they might need to move there. And we will end all for profit long-term care homes as quickly as possible with a target to 2028. We will build and redevelop 58,000 spaces in hundreds of smaller non-profit care homes that look and feel like actual homes that have PSW nurses and other specialists on site 24-7, increase direct care to an average of at least four hours a day to help them out. Thank you. Frontline workers and long-term care staff are burnt out and wondering if they were even heard through the pandemic. As stated in the survey, if you haven't had a chance to hear it, the Family Council Action Coalition says 45% of nursing staff and PSWs are working double shifts. 67% said that their long-term care home is not generally adequately staffed on weekends and holidays. I can validate that those are some of the most important times for the residents as being a recreation therapist. I work in long-term care and I experience these numbers firsthand. Staffing shortages equate to poor consistency of care. There are longer wait times for responses to call buttons with rush care for residents. There's a lack of experienced staff with dementia training. And on average, 70% of residents have dementia in long-term care. 56% of PSWs say that they sometimes too rarely have the time to complete their needs. These are people. they are people like you and I in long-term care with higher needs. So why are we not treating them as such? There's no room for profit in health care. Thousands of elders lost their lives and many more suffered since the outbreak of COVID-19. And this isn't going away anytime soon for the residents. A bad situation was made worse by negligence and a failure to act from this government. Taking an action means taking a full commitment to prioritizing care over profits and to implement recommendations from the long-term care COVID-19 commissions and other reports to improve care for elders. It means investing into better working conditions for staff and in turn this will increase the quality of life for residents. It means hiring more staff and committing to a minimum of four hours of care per resident in long-term care and not in four years from now. Talk is really cheap <laughs> if action is not taken. And I will continue to push this government to improve the living and working conditions in our province in long-term care homes. Senior care must not be limited to care homes. It should also include investments in innovative home sharing plans and other measures that will allow people to remain independent in their own homes as long as possible. The pandemic has shed light on serious problems of substandard care and poor working conditions in private for-profit long-term care homes, and in particular, foreign homes. The Greens are, are committed to improving the quality of life. Carly, you'll start off with this next question. Grant County is growing rapidly. However, our infrastructure is not growing as quickly. The need for health care, schools, parks, internet, water, sewage treatment, and transportation upgrades are some main concerns. These items are often budgeted for Ontario's larger urban areas, but growing smaller municipalities are often forgotten. How will your party ensure that these needs are a priority in Brant County? So the Green Party will work with the municipality government in Brantford-Brant to address the infrastructure deficits. 
will recognize, we recognize that communities like Brant are going to need provincial help to address aging infrastructure, particularly in the face of climate change. Much of infrastructure that we have today was not designed with today's weather in mind. We can all think about the floodings. The Green Party will create a two billion per year climate adaptation fund to help municipalities like Brant and Brantford to get along, to get to the long overdue work of retrofitting aging infrastructure. We'll provide direct, dedicated funding for retrofitting all provincially owned buildings with priorities given to the community housing and long-term care homes. The COVID-19 crisis in our hospitals proved just how vulnerable and untentable hallway healthcare is. The Brant Community Healthcare System has been advocating for permission to plan a redeveloped hospital site since before the last provincial election. Despite commitments made at that time in 2018, the government of the last four years still has not granted permission to start this process. The people of Brantford, Brant County, Six Nations, and the extended communities deserve reliable, safe, and equitable access to health care. The Green Party continues to support the urgent need for increased hospital capacities in Brantford Brant. That said, the point of this question was more about how we're going to ensure that these needs are met. And for the last four years, Ontario Green Party leader Mike Schreiner has been a consistent thorn of reality on the Premier's side. As the lone Green MPP with far fewer resources than the other parties, Mike has continuously held the government accountable for the... Con sorry. He's held the government accountable, especially on environmental issues. Mike's successes in passing the first green bill in history by working across the aisle with other parties in the legislature. As just one MPP out of 124, Mike has proven that the green perform and achieve well above their weight. Imagine what we could do with a caucus of at least 12. I'm good to go. Um, so I think it's, um, it's sometimes the case that municipal government is seen as sort of the least glamorous uh, of the various levels of government. And I also think that's a misbegotten notion because it's where the services that you interact with daily uh, are, actually, are actually handled. Um, it's where safe roads and clean water and, and daycares and transit, uh, transit come from. And municipal councillors are the closest level of government to, to people. Um, they, they, and so what they need is they need a partner in Queen's Park. They need a no surprises approach to dealing with Queen's Park. They can't do the planning that they need to do in an atmosphere of constant uncertainty, which is something that has been de developed over four years uh, through the Doug Ford government. And what we've seen is a relationship between the provincial government and municipal governments all across the province that's it's simply broken. Um, the last four years have really been, when it comes to municipal government, they've been about Doug Ford. And it's time we made the next, uh, the next four years about you and your interaction with your local government. So municipalities right now aren't getting the stable funding that they need. Um, it's clear that Doug Ford doesn't care about their wishes. He's been bullying mayors and municipal councils uh, so that he can get his way. He's forced uh, municipalities to change their boundaries to develop farmland and green space despite the fact that residents and local councils didn't want to do it even voted against it um, he uses uh, continually ministerial zoning orders to override the planning rules um, in order to secure large development contracts for his for his buddies so I want to work with Andrea Horvath and the municipalities to to address this we um, want to take out, like I said, a no surprises approach and make sure that there is stable, reliable funding. And when you have that, then you can begin a, a proper planning process. Um, we want to give municipalities the support they need um, and the kind of transparent partnership that they deserve. And again, it's, it's about relationships, not unlike some of the other interactions. Give municipalities the power to decide how to run their own elections so they can, they can determine their own governance structures and make decisions on that basis. 
reverse the unfair downloading uh, of costs, the public health costs, and, and restore the traditional um, provincial share of public health units and restore integrity to uh, the land use planning process. May I ask which question we are at? It's still there was a lot of confusion from my side. Infrastructure and priority. Okay. Question. That's fine. Yeah. Strange part is, we most of the funding goes to the urban areas, or we we see that's happening, and people are moving towards the rural and uh, county areas. So it is important to have complete community and smart and robust planning for affordable and resilient houses. We are committed to supporting municipalities to quickly approve new housing and build complete, integrated, resilient, and safe neighborhoods with access to fast, reliable, affordable public transit systems, recreational amenities, parks and trails, as well as critical public infrastructure, such as hospitals, schools, childcare centers, and long-term care homes. We will allow fast-tracking projects of critical significance like healthcare and hospitals. We will build 58,000 long-term care spaces, 30,000 new community care spaces, and 28,000 redeveloping and modernizing existing spaces. I will work on exp uh, expediting new hospital project. There is one which is in process. It's at stage second. I will definitely expedite that project to next level. Parks. Ontario Liberals will be creating five new provincial parks. We will create green spaces for kids to play, camping grounds for family trips, and uh, while helping protect our environment. In, Ontario Liberals will help with the digital media and helping small businesses to, to tap on and build on digital market space and fund new business owners. Our environmental plan will divert and recycle 60% of waste free from landfills by 2030 as well to give, give us clean, clean and healthy environment. Thank you. Okay, Ruby, you'll start off with this next one. People living with disabilities are finding living with inflation extremely challenging. There have been no increases given to those with dis disabilities in four years. Many people work only part-time jobs. They are finding it hard to pay for the basics, such as housing, utilities, childcare, and groceries. Some are assessing food banks to survive. Again, this category was left out of the federal budget but the needs have not changed. Access to housing and services remains an issue. How do you plan to address the needs of those living with disabilities? Thank you. Ontario Liberal government will increase the rate of Ontario Disability Support Program and Ontario Works, recognizing that the current rates are not enough for people to live on the rate they are having. We will take we will take whole of government approach towards supporting people with disability that involves strengthening accessibility for Ontario with Disability Act standards, regular enforcement of EODA standards to ensure a high degree of compliance, developing updated and modern standards for critical services such as education and healthcare, designing more accessible homes as well as commercial and institutional spaces and training professional services providers such as architects on accessible design and uh, development. I know, I'm, I'm, te I'm training one of the architects for that as well. Though we are building, we are building a new build there and uh, architects sometimes don't even know about that. So we, we train them, we tell them. The passport program operated by Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services help adults with a developmental disability to be involved in their communities and live as independent as possible. Investing in and strengthening the passport program will therefore be one of our key priorities. We will also enhance funding for the assistive, de assist assistive devices program to help people with disability and to pay for assistive and mobility devices. Our government will act decisively to address price gogging for assistive and mobility devices. We will eliminate the requirement of providing medical certificate to receive financial support to purchase basic in mobility aids. Universal basic income, we will reintroduce the universal basic in uh, income project back again. Thank you. Harry? 
Thanks. This is another one of those areas where um, I look at the Doug Ford government decision making and I simply can't fathom what's happening in their heads. Um, I don't believe Ontarians share the degree of callousness that the government has shown towards Ontarians with disabilities, um, but, uh, but they've continued to make things harder, harder for people on ODSP um, in ways that I, I can't understand as, as these folks sink deeper into poverty with each passing year and with now skyrocketing inflation. Um, and, you know, add to that the long delays in, in making Ontario fully accessible. Um, he cut, Doug Ford did, a planned increase to ODSP when he was first elected. It was meant to go up by 3%. It was raised instead by 1.5%. Um, and we, we haven't seen it move from there. He's certainly not taking the necessary steps to achieve full accessibility in Ontario by 2025, as re is required for, by the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, and, you know, for, for kids with autism, Look at what's happened there. He managed to double the number of kids on the autism wait list from 25,000 to over 50,000 kids and families who are struggling with the inability to access programs uh, that, they, that they absolutely need. But we can absolutely take steps to fix this as well and we can make Ontario accessible uh, for all. Step one, fully implement the AODA and ensure accessibility to all government services and programs. Um, I, would, uh, I would very happily work tirelessly as an MPP to build a barrier-free province, implement the Onley Report's recommendations as well, and raise ODSP rates. Um, step one, uh, immediately upon being elected, raise ODSP rates by 20% then make sure they never fall below the rate of inflation and do a, a significant consultation to make sure that that is um, sufficient. Uh, work with people who are, who are uh, knowledgeable in the field and who are stakeholders to ensure that, that we've got that right. Um, improve the Ontario Autism Program. Um, so that people have, uh, so, you know, people across the province with disabilities of various kinds and those on ODSP have a chance to live uh, with, with support, accessibility, and dignity. The cost of living is skyrocketing, but Doug Ford refuses to budge on the increase for ODSP rates. Today, Statistics Canada reports the largest annual increase in cost of living in over 30 years. The cost of food, energy, shelter, transportation is all increasing. How can Ontarians with disabilities live off of $1,168 a month? Making those, live, making those with disabilities live in poverty is discrimination. During the pandemic, a basic income was shown to be $2,000 a month. The fact that Doug Ford said the best way to support people on ODSP is to get them a job shows how completely out of touch he is with the challenges that people with disabilities face. Ontario Greens, well not just 20%, but we're going to double ODSP rates so that people with disabilities don't have to choose between putting food on their table or keeping a roof over their heads. We will mandate the universal design to ensure that new affordable housing stock is accessible for all and to create incentives for retrofitting homes to make them accessible. Greens will also make mental health care affordable and accessible for people with disabilities and support programs and services that will make an intersectional approach to care to meet the needs of people with disabilities. We are on board and also ensure the rapid implementation of the AODA. And this is something that we work with, with on, in long-term care and something that I'm familiar with and is worth going the extra mile. With the implementation of the AODA, we will see an increase in employment for groups that have been underfunded. One in four, Cana one in four Ontarians live with a disability and face various types of accessibility challenges in their everyday life. The AODA will help with that. We need to remove all these barriers that people with any type of disabilities face when trying to access meaningful employment. And lastly, we will increase high quality home care options for people with disabilities. Ontario Greens are the only ones with a real plan to help those with disabilities and we understand that you are being underfunded and underestimated in the workforce.
Harvey, you'll start off this next question. Ontario is participating in the $10 a day federal child care program. How do you anticipate the government funds will be dispersed, particularly to the County of Brant, to support this program? Will your party increase the number of child care facilities to enable all parents in Brant County who require affordable child care to be able to benefit from this program? So we, we start from the fact that Ontario families pay the highest child care fees in the country um, and in many cases those are fees the size of, of mortgage payments and although we're now past um, that stage I will remember um, the amount of money that got that got put into child care uh, is very significant and and you know we were in, we were relatively privileged so it's much much tougher for others um, Imagine being in a position of wanting to grow your family and really having to decide that you, you can't do that because you can't afford uh, the cost of additional child care. And we also know that the cost drives parents and most specifically it drives women out of the workforce, which hurts families, hurts the economy, um, and is just no way to build up the province going forward. And we know that early childhood educators, by and large, skilled, caring people are, are underpaid. And when that happens, some will walk away and they'll, they'll do something else. So while Doug Ford had months and months to address the $10 a day childcare deal with Ottawa, he didn't make it a priority and he waited until the very last minute to do it. So it, it tells you what, what he really cares about. He canceled reporting of COVID cases in child care centers. Um, he denied their staff N95 masks. He refused to give workers uh, pandemic pay. And again, this is about priorities. Um, you know, in the 15 years prior, we didn't see any significant effort to reduce child care costs. In fact, we saw, we saw costs skyrocket. So our, our goal as an NDP government is uh, to deliver a universal public nonprofit $10 a day child care in partnership with Ottawa um, and also to bring in $25 an hour starting wages for all registered early childhood educators and set wages at $20 per hour for, other, uh, for the other staff that work in the child care program because um, you can address affordability, but you won't actually get there unless you have the staff to, to be in these child care programs and take care of the children um, that, uh, that parents want to have there. Affordable child care in Ontario was long overdue before January 1st of this year. Instead of making the deal and signing onto the federal program like all the other provinces and territories, Ontario dragged its feel for an additional three months. Three months, more months that Ontario families paid the price and missed out on a fee relief, while all the other provinces and territories reduced child care fees by at least 25% retroactive up to January 1st. Ontario families, workers, and businesses deserve better. We all deserve better. Accessible, affordable childcare is an economic and social imperative. The Green Party is absolutely committed to ensure that there are sufficient, affordable childcare spaces and facilities accessible to families who need them. One of the key limitations to the number of childcare facilities is the number of childcare workers available to operate them. The Greens will also ensure that childcare workers are paid a fair wage and that we have the staff we need to open more affordable spaces for families. Ontario should be leading and not lagging. The Greens are ready to make real change and now's the time. Every dollar invested to childcare returns $2.50 to the economy. Ontario Liberals are committing to universal childcare for every family in Ontario. Liberals are the only government pledges to retroactive childcare rebate of 2,750 per child, which will benefit at least 200,000 families. And work with our federal part, uh, partners to implement universal $10 a day licensed childcare in Ontario, reducing average fees by over 80% and average, of, average saving of $10,000 per child per year. 
keep subsidize, uh, subsidies in place for lower income families and no cost below 20,000 net family income and partial subsidies up to approximately 45,000. Enhancing the 18 month parental leave program to ensure new moms and dads have the option to stay at home longer with their infants. We will also uh, choose options for caregivers, uh, people who choose options for caregiver outside the licensed childcare. We will enhance the childcare access and relief for expenses care program, which is a care tax credit by 50% to an average of $2,000, which, which will be provided in regular advance payments. ECE educators, they are not well paid, so we will in increase their wages from $20 per hour to 23, uh, uh, or between 23 and 40, hour, uh, 40 dollars per hour. Create 30,000 new jobs for early childhood educators and other child care, cent uh, center, uh, child care center staff, and 15,000 construction jobs to help create new child care spaces. Over three years in schools, workplaces, and community spaces where they are needed. Leverage our commitment to kill Highway 413 and reinvest the $8 billion to $10 billion in savings into our public-funded schools to build new child care centers in schools. We will ensure the particular child care needs of children with special needs, indigenous families, rationalized communities, and rural communities are met with flexible and inclusive care options, including a focus on licensed home care, expansion, and equitable funding approach for First Nations communities. Thank you. Harvey, you'll start off this question. What specific sources of alternative revenue are being considered to replace the 1.1 billion that is lost annual revenue to the Ontario government through the cancellation of licensed sticker plates and refunding of stickers? Do you feel that rather than providing refunds, the money could have been utilized for much needed funding in healthcare or public education initiatives? Yeah, I'm pleased to say we already had a plan in place when um, the Ford government launched this, um, I'll call it what I see it as, which is an election gimmick. Um, we know that low and middle income families in Ontario are pretty much tapped out with the affordability crisis that we're facing. That's not a well that, uh, that we can go back to. But there are very wealthy Ontarians and there are very large Ontario corporations that not only did well um, you know, in spite of the pandemic, in some cases they did well because of the pandemic and they are in a position to contribute to building the kind of society that we want to build in Ontario. So a low and middle class uh, tax freeze for four years, um, but looking to those who are absolutely in a position to, to contribute more um, would be how we would generate the revenue um, to do some of the things that, that we need to do in order to build Ontario up. At the same time, we can't be spending money on things that really provide no, no uh, advantage to Ontarians and especially to people in the riding of Brant for Brant. We have to cancel Highway 413. Um, which, which is um, just an environmental disaster and provides no benefit other than to developers who have already bought up all the land uh, through which the 413 will run. The Bradford Bypass, um, exactly the same kind of thing. Um, you know, what we don't want to do is, is uh, have those expensive projects that just encourage sprawl and leave taxpayers paying a bill that they can't handle. Um, so what we want to do then is to, to work together with Ontarians to invest public money in the places that it matters. We've talked about the, some of those things in, in health care and, and seniors care. Um, we haven't talked much about it, but in, in quality education, um, which is an investment in Ontario's future and an investment in Ontario's kids. Um, and, and it seems to be viewed by the Ford government as a mere expense. Um, and we want to, to be in a position to bolster those services that matter most uh, to people and their families here. According to my view, this was the most insignificant, unthoughtful step by the current government. Although it's helping me, people are giving that money to me for my campaign. 
This termination of the car license fees and repayment of last year's money bribe the electorate, electorate with their own money adds nearly two billion to the deficit already there, making it up to 19.9 billion deficit now. Definitely, this money could have been utilized for infrastructure, much like which is needed, hospitals, and also for the growing um, population, repair of schools, expand existing transportation system, repair and building new roads, etc. If it's my choice, I would opt in for healthcare and education spending. There is a mental health which is in a very big need for the health. This money could have been gone towards that. For the mental health and well-being for employees, leadership training for managers and educators on mental health. And raise um, the cap on benefit maximums for the mental health. So that would be my take from this money. Thanks. Bill 84, the Fewer Fees to Cut Public Services Act. Yes, yes, I do feel that rather than providing refunds, the money that we could have utilized for much more funding in healthcare or public education initiatives. Ontario Greens, just to be clear, were the only party to vote against the Ford government's license plate sticker gimmick. We had $1.1 billion lost in revenue that could have gone to the issues that we are gathered here today to discuss. Instead, it is being made to make cuts. So the solution to that, I think we need a new change in government. The Green Party wants to earn your vote. We don't want to buy it. To answer your question is one of the how many examples on how we need to do politics differently more than ever. $1.1 billion could help 1 million Ontarians that are facing surgical and diagnostic backlog or to help people who are waiting 2.5 years to access mental health services or to support the people on ODSP who are living in crushing poverty well below the poverty lines or the families with special needs children who are begging and desperately needing access to early intervention services and supports or to pay fair wages to the frontline healthcare heroes who are underpaid, overworked, and underappreciated, or to the small businesses who are asking for expanded eligibility crisis under the Ontario Small Businesses Support Grants. We are told over and over again that there is not money available to provide these essential public services for people in our community, and we must do better. Choosing a different path Choose one that learns and reimagines for a better future, a caring and better future. We need to build back. And Greens say we need to build back smarter. Policies that are implemented now will affect us for life. <coughs> Question 10, and Carly will respond first. Inflation has hit a rate of 5.7, the highest since August of 1991, and voters were concerned about the rising cost of living. What is your position and your party's approach to mitigation of infla inflationary drivers to lessen the pressure on the cost of living concerns of voters of the County of Brant? It's getting more and more expensive for people to keep a roof over their heads, to put food on the table, to keep the lights on, and just to get around. The Ontario Greens have real, sustainable solutions to these affordability challenges that are facing Ontarians. The Ontario Greens Affordability Action Plan will include four things. The first one, we're going to immediately address the housing affordability crisis by expanding zoning options to increase housing supplies. We will also implement vacancy and rent controls on all units. The second thing we're going to do is make it more affordable for people to get around. Immediately, we will cut transit fees in half for the initial three months, and we're going to make it more affordable to drive and bike electric by offering rebates for up to $10,000 for electric cars and $1,000 for e-bikes and use electric cars. The third thing we're gonna do is save energy and lower people's utility bills. We'll do this by launching a transformative green retrofit program, and we'll offer real incentives to make efficient heat pumps affordable. And lastly, the fourth thing that we're going to do right away is address the skyrocketing food prices. 
permanently protecting farmlands from urban sprawl and freeze urban boundaries. We will also implement a grocery code of conduct to protect farmers, local food producers, and consumers. Thank you. Province like Ontario, rich and healthy, no one should struggle to make the ends meet. According to Statistics Canada, food prices in Ontario rose 8.2% in the last year, adding yet another burden on struggling families. Ontario Liberals will remove provincial taxes on prepared foods such as the hot food counters in community grocery stores or a meal at a local restaurant by increasing the exemption from provincial tax for prepared foods from $4 to $20. We will replace the minimum wage with a living wage, developing a living wage structure that provides wages people can actually live on in different regions. Make sure every worker is covered by benefits, adding portable benefits. Celebrate self-employment and help entrepreneurs succeed by providing help to get loans, start and establish new business by live helpline. We eliminate the incorporation fee for the new businesses as well. Match, match the savings up to $1,000 a year for low income earners to save for retirement. Support small businesses to rebuild, no corporate no corporate tax for two years on the businesses hard hit by pandemic, scaled by the lost revenue for two years. Thank you. It's getting harder and harder for folks to, um, with the restrictions of the affordable, affordability crisis, to make choices that allow them to live their best lives. Their choices are getting crowded out by housing costs, by food, by gas, um, and, they, and it makes it very, very difficult to pursue the things they want to, want to pursue. So prices are going up, local businesses got, got hammered in many cases through the pandemic, and through all of it, we had a premier who was absolutely no friend to workers. Um, a premier who cancelled a minimum wage increase for years and uh, during a pandemic went so far as to deny workers paid sick days, um, which I mean both caused individual and societal hardship uh, in the midst of the pandemic. The Bill 124 wage cap, again, just an attack on working people who do crucial roles within our society, um, driving people out of the profession. So, this has to end now, and we, we need to reverse it. So step one, a, 20, uh, a path over, over the, the first four-year term to a $20 minimum wage um, so people can afford to live. Ten permanent paid sick days uh, so that people don't go without because they got sick or aren't forced to go to work sick and cause others uh, to get sick as well. Stand up for local businesses instead of the big box stores um, and provide a thousand dollar tax credit for local tourism businesses so that they have a chance to catch up after the, after the hits they've taken. I've talked about housing. Um, uh, and I've talked to some extent about childcare, but accelerating the move to $10 a day childcare will help with affordability. I want to bring down, and we have a comprehensive plan to bring down hydro prices, which have gotten astronomical as well. Um, create a provincial food strategy that gets, that gets healthy, locally sourced food onto Ontario tables. Um, you, can, you can maintain prices and also support people working in, uh, in that field. Gas prices should be fair and stable and they should be competitive and, and they should be uh, regulated so that, so that uh, big oil producers can't gouge Ontarians um, as they are currently doing. Um, and a universal pharmacare and dental care program would mean that people wouldn't be dipping into their pockets, um, maybe displacing other things that they really want or need to do uh, because the cost of their pharmaceuticals and their dental care is so high. And our final question of the evening, Ruby will start. Many municipalities surrounding the County of Brant have a green waste recycling program. At the amount of highly compostable green items can be removed from our traditional waste and reduce the amounts of methane gas they produce, which lead to global warming. What are your thoughts on encouraging a green waste program in the County of Brant? 
Thank you. Very valid question. Absolutely. I'm in favor of green waste recycling program. The Green Bin program is responsible for diverting biodegradable organic waste that can be composed to divert waste from landfills. Almost 50% of household waste by weight is an organic material. Ontario Liberals' environmental plan will combat the climate emergency and cut carbon pollution in half. This plan will divert and recycle 60% of waste from landfills by 2030 and 85% by 2050. We can do this by redesigning waste out of our system, exercising, reuse, compositing, recycling, and reintegration of materials back into the economy, preserve existing landfill space, conserve our natural resources, and reduce our carbon footprints. Collecting and processing organic into nutrient-rich compost and nourish, nourishing to nourish the soil. The green bins are used for collecting kitchen and other plants or animal waste. This type of waste rots completely when buried in the soil. It includes wastes like plate scrapings, vegetable peelings, meat and bones, cooked and uncooked food, and cut flowers. So this is a really good program. I will definitely encourage, once I will be your MPP, and talk and sit with the municipalities. I, need, I know they need funding for this, so we will definitely arrange for that. Thank you. Carly. This is a great question, and this is something I'm extremely passionate about. Part of Canada Day, it was an initiative to divert food from landfill for the celebration. We kind of said the go big or go home, so we chose the biggest festival in Brantford to start off with. We not only showed that it was possible, and we delivered some amazing results. We received a lot of positive feedback from the people at the event. We had composting, recycling, and a waste bin available for Canada Day. Many were already asking the same question that's being asked here tonight three years ago. Why doesn't Brantford and Brant County have a green bin program? What's missing is a twofold situation. The political will to prioritize waste diversion and the local infrastructure to do so. The political will. First, we have to understand that waste is not just an environmental problem and greens are also people people. It is an economic problem. Typically, the cost of waste is thought in terms of operating the landfill, but it's only a small fraction of the real cost. Something that the people of Brant know very well based on our experience with the expansion of Biggers Lane, the true cost is that replacing the landfill is exponentially higher than the day-to-day -day cost of running the landfill. It is far less expensive to divert to compostable waste from landfill so green bin programs are not just good for the environment, they're good for reducing municipal costs and the burden of waste of taxpayers' money. Secondly, the Green Party will also help municipalities create and improve green bin programs to divert food and biodegradable waste from landfills. We're going to do this by phasing in a ban on food waste from landfill that includes both household and non-residential as a recommendation by the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And we'll make Ontario the third province in Canada to do this. Supporting the building of waste processing sites to turn the waste back into useful materials like compost and biogas. By keeping food and compostable waste out of the landfill, the Green Party will help municipalities create green jobs fight climate change, and keep property taxes down. Thank you. So in my mind, um, climate change and environmental degradation, they impose a moral obligation on us on behalf of our children, on behalf of our grandchildren, and, and the generations that will follow them. So you know, this is a piece that's wrapped up in that. And it, it's you know, surprising to me that, um, that within this writing we haven't gotten to these kinds of programs to some extent. You know, I'm, I'm, I have to say I am surprised by that. But I guess what isn't surprising is that there has been no support from the provincial government uh, for this kind of approach. Um, and, and maybe that helps to explain why these things haven't moved forward. If the best uh, predictor of future behavior is what somebody has done in the past, you need to take a look at Doug Ford's environmental record. 
This is a guy who three times tried to carve up uh, the green belt. He's not interested in protecting. He's not interested in protecting the green belt. Um, he is interesting. Interested in allowing his buddies, the developers, to to make money off it. He's gutted conservation authorities. Um, he absolutely inexplicably actually paid hundreds of millions of dollars to rip down rather than to build up wind farms. He tore electric charging stations out of the ground. Um, and so if you're looking for somebody to, to stand four square behind uh, uh, environmental improvement, he's not your guy. Um, I would, I would love to advocate and fight for uh, a green waste pro program. I think it's exciting. Um, we're ready to work with municipalities. We talked about, I talked earlier about having relationships that are, that are supportive, that are stable, that are predictable, um, so that municipalities can expand, uh, can, can plan rather, and we want to expand recycling, composting services, um, and promote an economy of repairable goods. So we can work closely with the municipalities to achieve that. We can work with industry and stewardship Ontario as well. Um, we can improve and expand producer responsibility model of waste diversion so that those who create it have to, uh, have to take care of it. Um, to include more sectors and we need to set higher recycling targets and those are things I'd be very happy to work towards. I want to thank all of the candidates for coming this evening and for sharing their party's platforms with us. We really appreciate it. I want to thank my co-moderator, Marin Sewell. I appreciate her help this evening. I'd like to thank the Women Inspiring Women members who acted as our door greeters and timekeepers. And I'd like to thank the chamber, um, our chamber coordinator and other fellow board members for assisting in this evening's process. We also would like to thank the Four Paris Centre and uh, their staff for helping out and Atomic Spark for doing the live streaming. And we'd like to thank the, uh, Paris, um, the uh, Paris Central School for additional parking. Although with the rain, it didn't seem we didn't need it. <laughs> the election with stops tomorrow. You have an option to vote by mail, in person, or at advanced polls, or at a polling station on June the 2nd. You can visit the Provincial Election website for more information on how to register as a voter and find your polling station. Please exercise your democratic right and vote. Thank you very much for attending. You are welcome to stay and mingle with the candidates and we wish you safe travels home.